Welcome to the second and final part of my review of Almando Calvo, i.e. Christ Righteous, i.e. Elf Dockings' book. The stuff I reviewed in the first part was bad. It's probably worth watching that. This is worse. Way, way worse. Ah! We're in chapter three now! We're almost done! <laughs> Kinda. This chapter's called The Big Blob Theory. If you remember my previous videos, you might guess, accurately, that we've been over a lot of this stuff already. So this should go a little bit faster. And I'm probably gonna eat those words later. So skipping a bunch of the first pages, we get to a bit about morality. Morality? Sheesh, who's this morality person you speak of? Is there anything this guy won't turn into a person? Who knows, does anyone even care? Are you even watching this? You don't have to, you know. I had to read the whole book. Had to. Yeah? You have a choice. You're making a very bad one. But I guess I'm glad you're here with me anyway, so he goes on. We might as well break every rule and law, live our best life by doing all the evil that we want. Yeah, you're not going to be living your best life doing that. Having everything our way. Who cares about striving as a society? I want what you have and what she has, and I'll kill to get it. Apparently this is the level he thinks he would, and in fact should, operate on, without the threat of hell to hold him back. It's a pretty good example of how Christianity tries to strip people of basic, cooperative social morality, and replace it with nothing but a tenuous layer of fear. Fortunately, most times I don't think it really works, and the deconverted, finding themselves free of the only thing they thought was holding them back from horrible, horrible actions, generally don't suddenly go on a rampage, which kind of puts the lie to this manipulative junk. So now he gives us an analogy from C.S. Lewis relating morality to a fleet of ships. He gives the quote, and he credits the quote, and then he sums it up in his own words. In other words, morality is like a fleet of ships insofar as it is concerned with three things. First, morality is social. It is concerned with fairness and harmony between people. Second, morality is individual. It is concerned with harmony within the individual person. And finally, morality has a purpose connected with the overall purpose of human life. Which I find to be quite a compelling and succinct statement of non-theistic morality. Very nicely written, Almondo. For once, well done. Oops, sorry, never mind, that was copy-pasted from Psychology Today. Remind me again why I'm reviewing this book if the author barely wrote any of it? Ah, oh, right, because he was so utterly confident about its quality that he challenged all atheists to read it and guaranteed it would convert us. So, Almando, when do we get to the part that converts me? Can we get it over with? He's got a lot to say on morality, and frankly, I'm past caring much, but here's the thing. Do you really believe that's how the world is? Do you actually believe that if someone kidnapped your mom or child, beat them, tortured them, and then mutilated their bodies, committing suicide with a smile on their face and never wrecking a just punishment, goes unpunished? Do you really believe that they're going to get away with that? Yeah. Whether I like it or not has absolutely no relevance here. That's what would happen in that scenario, to whatever extent you could say he got away with it if he ended his life. Reality is not defined by your preferences, Almondo. It's defined by reality. You can hope and wish that what you just said is false all you want, but that doesn't make it false. I most definitely do not think so. I believe that there is a final judgment, and I believe that there is an eternal place of punishment called hell for those people. Yes, I know. And the fact that you believe it, the fact that you prefer it, doesn't make it real. Hate to break it to you. I know you wish you were God and that your imagination created reality, but it doesn't. But so yeah, page 41 just has a picture of a Futurama character. Just stuck in there, in a book, sold for money as a product. No reason, no commentary, nothing. Now, personally, I don't care that much about stuff like that, but this is Disney we're talking about, which makes this a completely boneheaded move. Well, over top of the Futurama blob guy, he says, Okay, let's just say life is truly meaningless. We are really nothing more than molecular machines driven by the process of our DNA. What does this prove? How does this disprove God in any way? The answer to which is, it doesn't? Up to this point, he hasn't mentioned anyone who says it does. Is this even a thing people say? I mean, what you just said, if true, leaves plenty of room for at least, like, a deistic god, if you're so into believing it. And there's plenty of other theistic gods people have come up with, or could come up with, that don't rule this out. So I have no idea who Almando thinks he's arguing with here, and I can only imagine he doesn't either. So, in my responses to him, I discussed his argument that if your brain is a product of nature, you can't trust it, because it might lead to incorrect conclusions or use poor reasoning. He expands on that idea here. 
How can you truly be confident in your thoughts if it's nothing but a byproduct of an evolutionary process? How can you say your process led you the right direction, whilst someone else's direction led them another way? How can you trust your own thoughts and therefore confidently be an atheist? Okay, Helmondo, then let's accept your hypothesis instead. My brain's not like that. My poorly functioning, brainy, blob mind doesn't exist. Nobody has one, I don't have one, you don't have one, nobody. Just like you, I have a soul, and thus I am free of all the imperfections of the natural human brain. My mind, being God-made and infallible, just like yours, incapable of incorrect conclusions, incapable of misleading me, incapable of fallacious thinking, invariably leads me in the right direction to the right conclusion. I can entirely trust my thoughts, I can rely on them, I can reach conclusions with absolute confidence because I can only be right and never wrong. And all of that goes for you as well. So why do we disagree? And it's not just us. Why does everyone disagree? Why does everyone's mind seem so fallible? Why is everyone's mind so susceptible to basic fallacies, to failing to notice things, to being misled, to reaching different conclusions? In short, Almondo, why does your mind, and my mind, and everyone's mind seem to work exactly the way you say we should expect if the mind is the product of a natural brain? Why is it that after any amount of consideration, after looking at reality and comparing it to what you say we'd expect with my idea versus yours, your argument seems to favor my explanation over yours to such an extreme degree? Uh, chapter 4 now. Only way too much to go. How does a 70-page book feel this long? If truth exists, then God exists, because in order to have truth, the universe has to have a purpose. That is, in order for anything to be true about reality, in order for reality to basically be anything, it requires that reality be given a purpose by God, which is very interesting. Does that mean that without God first being given a purpose by God, the truths of God's existence and nature couldn't be true? It can't be true that he exists without him giving himself a purpose, but he can't give himself a purpose without without it being true that he exists. I don't know, at this point I'm just sharing quotes that seem funny to me, because I gotta entertain myself through this somehow. Hey, how about this one? If premises began to exist without reason, then conclusions from them are also without reason. What's that mean? I don't know, sounds like gibberish to me. I'd ask Almondo, but he probably doesn't know either, because I bet he just stole it, and I don't think he knows what a premise or a conclusion even is. I bet he wrote this gem, though. If God absolutely does not exist, why do I need a title to describe in whom I don't believe to exist? Why is God attributed to a title? As if the answer isn't just that's the name you came up with for your thing that we're talking about? Beautifully written, by the way, man. Fantastic job. It's got your authorial voice all over it. Here's how he summarizes why consciousness can only be explained by God. Awareness and life cannot come from an impersonal force because those principles are a personal attribute, so it must come from a person. Now, I'm looking for any sort of reasoning there, and I don't see it. As is so common with elf dockings, we have the start and the end of an argument, and absolutely no middle. I guess he just doesn't feel like this requires a middle, because his religious assumptions are just so obvious. On page 47, we have an argument about the origin of human consciousness, which is plagiarized straight off some WordPress blog. And I know that at this point I barely need to mention plagiarism. By now it's kind of a safe assumption that most things in here are going to be plagiarized to some extent or another. But still, it's funny to point it out, so I'm gonna. On the same page, he lists six people who he claims are neuroscientists. I refuse to even take that at face value at this point, and it's notable because he fails to capitalize even one single surname. That's it, that's the only reason I'm mentioning it. How does that even happen? He's capitalized surnames earlier in this book. He'll do it again later. So why are none of them capitalized here? Who the hell knows? I guess it's just optional. He defends his assertion that God must have created human consciousness with this gem, which is another one of my favorites. And it would be hard to assume that these assertions are nothing more than the God of the Gaps argument because we are not just filling the gaps of missing information with God. In fact, God is filling the gaps of the missing information that we so desperately seek. We just need to be a bit more honest here. Right, so we're not filling the gaps with God, we're just filling the gaps with God. God, atheists, be a bit more honest. Now he moves on to Anselm's ontological argument for God as interpreted by someone on some website that he plagiarized from. No way, he plagiarized? I can't believe it. 
Also, for my money, this is among the worst forms of argument in all of religion. It's presented as though it leads to the conclusion that God has to exist in reality. If God exists as an idea in the mind, but does not necessarily exist in reality, then we would be able to imagine something greater than God. But we cannot imagine anything that is greater than God, but God still exists in the mind as an idea. Therefore, God necessarily exists in reality. No, therefore you think you must imagine that he necessarily exists in reality for your fantasy to be logically consistent. That doesn't make it real. Your fantasies don't become real just because you imagine they have to be real, Anselm. Why am I talking to you anyway? This isn't your book. Get out of here. Oh hey, it's chapter 5. Qualities and Values. When I made my three-part re-response to Almondo, it really annoyed me that he kept using the words values and value interchangeably, because they actually mean pretty different things. Here we get a paragraph that shows that he has no idea what either of those words mean. What if you don't believe you have any values? Well, I would ask you if you actually believe that. Is that something you truly believe in your heart? If you said yes, then you just told me that you value your own thoughts and opinions. You hold on to a thought or an idea that you as an individual have no values. But in order to make that assumption, you have to believe in that thought. Therefore, having value for that specific thought makes that thought valuable enough to believe in. If you said you don't know, then again, you still told me that you value your own ignorance. Of course, the problem here is the same as before, the use of values and value as though there's no difference in meaning between them. As though you can just put whichever one of them you want in a sentence and it means the exact same thing. And that last sentence in particular is revealing. If you said you don't know, then again you still told me that you value your own ignorance. Do I? Or do I just acknowledge its existence? I might hate it, but that doesn't mean I'm going to deny it's real. Does Almondo perceive the difference? I don't think so. Values bring us to beauty. Humanity has a perspective on beauty. We may look at a mushroom growing in the ground and think, ew, that's ugly, but then see a rose blossom and say, wow, that's beautiful. I just included that because of the random attack on mushrooms. Mushrooms are awesome, dude. And beautiful. And roses are boring as hell. Eat shit. Now, I'm just bringing this up because I really want to, but it also causes a problem for the assertion that humanity has a perspective on beauty. No, it doesn't. For sure there are some general trends, common but definitely not universal preferences, which are typically explained fairly easily through evolution. But there's definitely not just one idea of beauty that everyone holds. Where do we get the idea of beauty from? What is beauty? It would seem that logically imperfection exists because of sin. Okay, fascinating. What's the logic? Right, that's what I thought. Beauty, wherever it is seen, reflects what is known by the beholder. And now he has a quote. Not just something somebody else wrote that he pasted in as though it's his own writing, but a quote, like with a quotation mark. Symmetry, that's imitation like kaleidoscopes or round stained glass, is often a great producer of... I'm not going to bother reading more because there's no end quote, and so this quote may or may not go all the way to the end of this rather long paragraph, which also happens to be the end of this section. This is a problem that comes up a number of times through the book. Sometimes he actually bothers to mark something as a quote, and he'll put an opening quotation mark, but then not put the corresponding closing one. If this book were code, it wouldn't even compile. Also, Elmondo, just because you put a quotation mark, that doesn't make it okay to copy someone else's work with no credit. There's absolutely no source mention for this quotation, or for most of the other ones. So even when he actually bothers to quote instead of just taking, it's still basically plagiarism. It turns out this quote is from Christian Apologetics Alliance, and it gets surprisingly close to making sense at one point when it's talking about the beauty we see in the order of rocks on a beach. The beauty cannot be in the rocks themselves. Yes, great, right, keep going. So there must be a transcending beauty in relation to all creation. Oh, so close and yet so far. You fell into the false dichotomy trap right by the finish line. Chapter 6 now, look at me go. Such speed, such grace. Like an otter in... Blender. Now, chapter 6. Oh, let me tell you about chapter 6. You're gonna want to know about chapter 6. Chapter 6 is about miracles and the supernatural. And the plagiarism. The plagiarism is just, uh... It's, uh... <laughs> uh, I, um... You know, I didn't want my video to be all about plagiarism. I really didn't. I came into this intending to just point out a few things I found really poorly written or badly argued or kind of funny and be done with it. You know, a short, sweet little video just to show you how bad this book is. Ha ha ha, we all have fun and we go home. 
But I'm sorry, how can I not talk about this when it's this regular, when it's this obvious? If I ignore the plagiarized parts, there's no book left to review. There's a few paragraphs here and there that sound like they were written by a six-year-old, but that's not a book. And, you know, at this point, I can't even assume those sections that I think he wrote himself aren't plagiarized either. He could have just copied something that really sucks or edited something to suck more. Why should I trust him at this point to ever do anything himself? So I'm sorry, mostly to myself, by the way, but I've got to talk about this. It has to happen. Chapter 6 starts off with an entire paragraph copied without any changes whatsoever from a live science article about Colton Burpo, the heaven is for real kid who supposedly saw Jesus and who cares. After that, Almondo takes a break from the plagiarism to insert, Let us take a moment to think about this. There are many stories about out-of-body experiences. In fact... And I stop at in fact, because after that he pastes another paragraph from later in the same article, making the sentence, in fact, several studies, blah blah blah. Now in the article that he copied this from, the word several starts a sentence, and so it has a capital S. And Almondo can't even be bothered to change it to lowercase. <laughs> look, look. We know this guy doesn't care about plagiarism. We know he doesn't care if he gets caught. At this point, I question if he even knows plagiarism is a problem. That much I already figured out the first time I read this book, obviously. But still, his sheer nerve somehow surprised me here. Like, I know he doesn't bother to switch words around or break out a thesaurus to hide the plagiarism, but seriously, he couldn't even be bothered to change the case of one letter so it fits into his sentence? Not even just for stylistic reasons? Nothing? How does someone have this little concern for anything they ever do? How did he seem this excited to receive the proof copy of this fucking abomination? Praise God. <sighs> Look at this beauty. <laughs> Who has this little self-respect? Who has this little dignity? How can anyone go through life doing things like this and feel any level of inner peace? Any level of self-confidence? How can I explain this person? How can I understand his motivations? What's it like inside his head? I don't know, I just don't know. Honestly, I don't, I wanna know. I wanna comprehend because I'm just confused. But I don't comprehend, I can't understand this. I don't know how this happens, I just don't know. And I guess that's the end of that thought. So he follows that up with an argument that I'm pretty confident he wrote himself because it sounds like it was scribbled in crayon on a playroom wall. For atheism to be true, meaning that God does not exist, atheists would have to disprove every single outer body experience that every individual had. Now is it possible that they could all be wrong? Yes. But is that reasonable? Absolutely not. In order to disprove every experience, you would have to either test every experience throughout history, or say that everyone who had made this claim is a liar. To call everyone a liar is an absolute lazy way to deny all the possibilities. Of course, Almondo, in his own absolutely lazy way, denies all possibilities beyond testing and disproving literally every outer body experience in all of history, or calling everyone a liar. Possibilities that don't seem that hard to imagine, such as discovering what's happening within the brain during such experiences to understand how they actually work. A possibility he never imagined, despite that being what the live science article he plagiarized was talking about. Of course, he doesn't know that because he's the biggest dumbass in all of human history. Next, he plagiarizes two paragraphs of a Healthline article about near-death experiences, and then presents his thoughts on the implication of this. This raises the question, if it's possible that we have a spirit, then the possibility of an afterlife is much more possible than not. It completely disproves macroevolution. So, maybe out-of-body experiences maybe raise the question that maybe it's possible that we have a spirit, possibly, and so maybe, possibly the afterlife is more possible than not possible, maybe. Therefore, macroevolution is completely disproven. I have no idea how all those maybes and possiblies are supposed to disprove anything, let alone something entirely unrelated to the subject, like macroevolution. But apparently Almondo knows how it does. I sure wish he'd tell us, but he's really busy writing a book right now. He doesn't have time to explain himself. Now we get a really odd conflation of infinite and eternal, which we've seen before in a video about this weird Muslim game show thing that I may or may not have actually published yet. So those of you who aren't supporters might have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> See, I have a problem lately, because I have so much going 
going on with this Christ Righteous stuff that I'm never quite sure when to publish anything else that I have in my queue. This feels much more time sensitive, in fact by the time I publish this video it's going to be much later than I would like. Oh well, I'll live. Anyway, we know that more than one eternal being couldn't exist in the same eternality, because if they were to exist in the same infinite realm, they would have to be considered equal and inseparable, not distinct but considered as one. In order to have more than one eternal being, there would need to be a distinction by which one can determine its difference. And if one lacks something the other has, then the being that lacks can't be infinite, because an infinite being by definition lacks nothing. Somewhere in there he switched from talking about a being that's existed forever to a being that lacks nothing and is infinite. I guess his brain just kind of rebooted in the middle and he didn't bother to read back the first half of the sentence before he wrote the second half. Or, maybe, the second half and the first half don't come from the same place. None of this thing sounds clever at all, but it sounded way too clever for him, so I searched I don't have enough faith to be an atheist for the phrase lacks nothing and immediately found the source for the second half of Almondo's thought. It's taken with a bit of meaningless modification, presumably from copying it out of the book, from chapter 8. Predictably, though, Turek and Geisler are not talking about eternal beings like Almondo is. The paragraph in question is about how Mormonism can't be true because polytheism can't be true because there can't be more than one infinite being for the reasons Almondo copied and then misapplied to an eternal being because he didn't understand what they were saying. Finding this part about Mormonism in Turek and Geisler's book was interesting to me for another reason, though. Because we're coming up to a chapter in Almondo's book about other religions and why they can't be true. And since I don't have enough faith to be an atheist talks about other religions... Yeah, you know where this is going. Almondo really likes this book. Now we're on to miracles. Many atheistic scientists today agree with the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1-1. Oh yeah, that quote gets a citation, of course. Now they may not agree that it was God, but they agree that the universe had a beginning. So they agree with the verse, except for what the verse actually says. I've heard of appealing to authority, but appealing to authorities you say disagree with the thing you're using them to support? That's a bold move. There are numerous, well-attested miracles in history. Elf Dockings wrote this, then he brought up zero examples, then he moved on, so I'll do the same. If someone says that miracles will one day be proven with science rather than a god, where does the burden of proof actually fall on? The person who claims that god was the cause, or the person that claims science was the cause? There are clearly two distinct claims here. The burden of proof as to whether it's a miracle caused by God falls on the person claiming that, and the burden of proof as to whether it will one day be proven to be caused by science? Very weird claim, by the way. Falls on the person making that claim. Mostly I just included this quote because it's funny to imagine someone declaring the cause of some supposed miracle as just science. That statue of Mary was crying blood. What caused that, Mr. Science Man? Silly religious type, isn't it obvious? Science did it! The end of this chapter on miracles is about how we can know the difference between true miracles from God and demonic spiritual experience. Demonic experiences, in other words, evil powers rise from the demonic influence of psychics. Somehow, despite the tarot cards and Ouija board in the background, I did not expect the psychics. Nobody expects the psychics! It is evil, falsehood, occult, and limited by which many religions are involved. Counterfeit signs from Satan do not give glory to God, nor do they show a righteous and holy act of power. They often tend to be associated with error and immoral behavior, and the experience does not lead you to God but leads you further away, making you become self-gratifying. So you see, demonic influences can be recognized if paying attention and understanding the core differences. That sounds awfully like the difference between good miracles and evil miracles is that the good ones are from your religion and the bad ones are from other religions. And if we back up a few pages, there's a passage that supports this interpretation. Skeptics argue that because all major religions claim miracles, attributing them to their deity and philosophy, and since these religions are not compatible with each other, all accounts of miracles are viewed as false claims. While it can be possible, 
possible that some of these claims are false for various reasons, there is another possible explanation, and that is that the supernatural forces of wicked and dark evil cause these events to deceive and confuse non-Christians. Oh sure, I suppose that's a possible explanation, but it's far more simple to see this just as an adherent of one religion cherry-picking the miracles that support his religion and smearing all the rest as demonic deception. And the chapter ends, appropriately, predictably, with a list plagiarized directly out of... I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Table 8.3. Hi Frank, hi Norman, been a while, how you doing fellas? Chapter 7 is about different religions, that's the one I mentioned earlier, and how we can know that one of them is right, instead of all of them being true at the same time. For the sake of truth, we are going to dismember every stronghold and investigate the facts, so that we may discover as to which religion points to the truth. I will not be biased during this investigation for the sake of fairness and honesty. After laughing at that until my belly hurt, I turned the page and found a list of religions. Three religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, are placed under the header of theism, and all the rest, despite most of them being labeled as pantheistic, polytheistic, or both, are placed under the non-theism heading. It's unclear to me how a religion like Hinduism can simultaneously be pantheistic, polytheistic, and non-theistic, but I guess I'm just not capable of grasping the complexity of thought employed at Christ Righteous Ministries. By which, of course, I actually mean Table 8.1 of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Hey, here's that paragraph on Mormonism again, complete with the stuff he plagiarized before about infinite beings and then screwed up. But now all of it's there, straight out of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist again. You know, plagiarizing's one thing, Almondo, but plagiarizing the same thing twice in the same book? That's next level. Yeah, you know, the first few chapters were bad for plagiarism, but the last more than half of the book might as well just be called a shitty reprint of I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. But anyway, then he tries to explain why polytheists aren't allowed in theist club. Polytheism denies the fact that there is a supreme being to whom all creatures owe their existence to. That creative phrasing, to whom all creatures owe their existence to, that that's obviously Almondo. Geisler and Turek were talking about angels and demons in Judaism and Christianity and Islam, and say, But that's not polytheism, which denies that there is a supreme, infinite, eternal being to whom all creatures owe their existence, and to whom all creatures are ultimately accountable. Almondo didn't want that last bit, so he just kind of chopped the sentence in half and stuck a two on the end and called it good. Regardless, no matter who wrote it, I believe the Hindus might like a word with you, to say nothing of the other religions on the list. But it's too late! As we can see now, since theism is true, polytheism is just as false as atheism, pantheism, and all other non-theistic worldviews. Guess where that came from? Every other religion is thrown out. Looking back on the remaining three theistic worldviews, we see that the remaining possibilities are Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Apparently, Turek, Geisler, and Almondo all deny that any other monotheistic religions exist. I think Almondo must have decided his list was incomplete, though, because in the rest of the chapter he goes on to include two other theistic religions, Judeams and Judaism. With regard to people inventing gods other than the one true god of Judeams, he explains, The desire to recreate God in our own image comes from the sin nature that is within us, a nature that will eventually and ultimately reap destruction. I don't know how that sentence ends, there's no period. For a Christian to say that seems a bit lacking in self-awareness, doesn't it? After all, the Christian god is so strikingly human-like that humans are described as made in his image. And I'm sure Almondo would come back and tell me, ah, but you see, our God is like us because he made us like him. Their God is like us because they made him like us. Yeah, of course. Despite being so very similar, your religion is very different and special because you say so. Anyway, here's one of the best lines in the entire book. Having read the book cover to cover, I'm not sure this one was ever topped. God has made salvation available as a free gift. It only costs you your faith and your whole life. <laughs> Let's just relax and let that one sink in for a few seconds. Okay, let's continue. Here's another nice one from the same page. Don't just lean on personal experiences, but pray, seek, and knock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he goes on. Look into the evidence and compare to other claims and follow the truth, even if it's contrary to your feelings and thoughts. Well, so far, Almondo's done a great job considering things that go contrary to his feelings, as we've seen. And as for the thoughts part, that sounds an awful lot like if you think about it and you figure out it makes no sense, stop it! Be willing to be wrong and accept what is right. 
Amando, buddy, in the history of this channel, I don't believe I've ever seen anyone with less room to say something like that than you have right now. Kindly shut up. On the next page, he calls Mormonism more manism. <laughs> more like more womanism, am I right? Heh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Now we're on to chapter 8, Biblical Reliability. It starts on page 78, so I guess really page 39, and by this point I was tired. You can understand why, I think. And now, barely halfway through the book, I was about to start into what for me is the most tedious area in all of Christian apologetics. Arguments from and about the Bible. And this goes almost all the way to the end of the book. Up till this point, I was frustrated, I was annoyed, but at least it was holding my attention. But from here on, though, there's nothing for me. Someone who's into this kind of thing might get a lot of fun out of the next 60 pages or so, but definitely not me. So we get a quote from the Institute for Creation Research, actually credited for once. Here's a citation from the Institute for Creation Research's website. Hear what they said. The Bible has become... Da, 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 da. Another quote with no end quote, so who knows where it's supposed to end. Like I said, this is a recurring problem. At the bottom of the page, we get a whole paragraph plagiarized from the Institute for Creation Research, which really makes you wonder why he bothered to credit the quote at the top of the page if he was just going to steal another one from them at the bottom. Or more generally, why he bothered to cite that quote when the entire book is made up of a patchwork of stolen quotes. What did it accomplish to do kind of not quite, but almost the right thing once. You might as well have just gone all the way and cited nothing ever. Hell, Almondo, you might as well have just taken credit for the Bible verses, too. He lists and describes some examples of archaeological findings related to the Bible. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Tel Dan inscription, the Caiaphas ossuary, and all the text about these is plagiarized from some Got Questions article. Then he describes the Ebla tablets, with all the text stolen from some AncientPages.com article. And then there's a description of the city of Jericho that he might have actually written himself, considering the quality of the writing. This discovery showed that the walls around the city had fallen down flat exactly as recorded in the Bible, Joshua 6.20, showing that the Bible had an accurate description of what had happened, and this finding shows that it was in fact an event that took place. This is followed by a list of other archaeological findings, just copy-pasted from the same ancientpages.com article that had the description of the Ebla tablets. You're seeing a pattern here, I know it's not even surprising to you, just remember this shit goes on for 60 pages. At the best of times, it would be boring for me to read this kind of stuff no matter what, because I'm I'm just not interested in this subject. But it's so much more boring when you know for a fact that what you're reading is just a bunch of random crap that the so-called author copy-pasted off some website, or maybe at best copied verbatim out of somebody else's book, probably without even reading it or caring how well it actually supports any claim he wants to advance or even understanding what the words mean. It's a waste of time. Admittedly, so is the rest of the book, but at least I enjoy those topics. This, though? I admit, I almost didn't make it through this. I almost just closed the book and said, fuck it. But I made it through. I read it. I read all of it. I don't know why I bothered. There's barely anything in this half of the book that I'm even slightly convinced did or even could have come from Almondo Calvo. Is there anything at least a bit entertaining here? Well... I mean, I guess. On page 89, he explains that the eyewitnesses to the resurrection were telling the truth because they were willing to die for their claims instead of receiving one of the three rewards that motivate one to make up a lie. Money, sex, and power. I mean, that's a little funny. Seems like an incomplete list at best. I don't know what kind of psychology you have to have to think that those are the only reasons people lie. There's also a section on all the incredible scientific knowledge the Bible displays that supports its divine origin. Stuff like stars are innumerable. That is, ancient people were like, damn, that's a lot of stars. The stars differ in glory. Or in other words, they were like, damn, that star is brighter than that star. Stars follow a predictable pattern. That is, when they watched the stars and the planets that they didn't know were not stars, they noticed them moving. The sun moves, which is supported with a verse from Psalm 19 that says, It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Gee, I wonder where they could possibly have got that idea. 
All humans are one blood, descended from one man and one woman. No, and do not bring up mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosomal Adam to me, I will slap you. God created animals after their kind. Meaningless drivel. Blood circulation. Taken from a verse in Leviticus where it says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Well, the animal sacrifice part I'm not convinced is scientifically demonstrated, but as for that first little bit, the life of a creature is in its blood, that just sounds like animals die when you take the blood out. Which, yeah, I'm fairly sure they figured that one out. Also, the growth of the body is controlled from the head. Again, absolute nonsense. I was thinking of doing all of these, but I decided to just pick out the ones I found the funniest because I need some entertainment here. But I got bored at some point and I stopped because what does it even matter? It's plagiarized directly off answers in Genesis anyway, who cares? Here's a defense of believing the Bible because the Bible says to. Skeptics have said that believing the Bible is divinely inspired because it says so is circular reasoning. However, if God is the ultimate source of knowledge and truth, which he is, then this would not be a circular reasoning fallacy, it would be wise. Okay, I mean, even if I accept that, for the sake of argument, how does that make it not circular reasoning to believe the Bible, not because God's the ultimate source of knowledge and you believe for other reasons that he wrote the Bible, but because the Bible says the Bible's true? You didn't even address that, Almondo. Oh hey, here's a list with the words neo-orthodox and plenary. If that's not plagiarized, I'll eat my hat. Yeah, it's from Got Questions. See, it's just that easy. You can do it too. But I would ask very sincerely, please do not give him money for this. I've already given him far more than he deserves, but at least I have this platform where I can show the world just what kind of scumbag behavior is going on here. Don't just buy this to read it, let it sit on a shelf, whatever. He deserves nothing for this. Less than nothing. The other list on the same page about criteria for including books in the New Testament is surprisingly completely original to Armando Calvo. Well done, man. At least you did something yourself, and it's not bad. Nah, <laughs> come on, of course that's plagiarized. Listen, I'll tell you what, okay? If I don't cover some section or some page from this point on, just assume it's almost certainly plagiarized, all right? All right, so jumping straight from page 94 to page 121, we find ourselves deep into a bunch of evidence for Jesus' resurrection. The section is called Evidence of Corroborating Archaeology and Other Writings. Now, I've very carefully made sure that what Almondo is presenting evidence for here is specifically the resurrection because, well, you'll understand why soon. And sure enough, everything leading up to this point is about the resurrection, and only the resurrection. Page 116, Resurrection of Jesus section. Page 117, Logical Explanation for the Accounts of Jesus' Resurrection. Eyewitness Accounts that Testify to the Resurrection of Jesus. Page 118, The Events of the Resurrection were recorded not long after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Page 119, There are many eyewitnesses witnesses that have claimed to have witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There were over 500 witnesses who had seen the risen Christ. Because they had actually seen the risen Christ, they were willing to die for what they claimed to have seen. And bizarrely, we also get the reiteration of the silly claim from page 89 that people only ever lie for money, sex, and power. Page 120 is all about eyewitness testimony about the resurrection, so everything leading up to page 121 is about the resurrection. Page 122 has that Paul murdered Christians and later became a Christian after encountering the risen Jesus. All non-Christian Jewish historians who wrote according to the evidence whether or not they believed that Jesus rose from the dead. We have men who had died for the claim that they had witnessed the risen Jesus. James was apparently an enemy according to the Bible, but after Jesus appeared to him resurrected, Directed, he then believed. So everything before and after the page that we're concerned with is about the resurrection. Evidence for the resurrection. And now here, on page 121, right in the middle of all of that, we have five corroborating archaeological evidence and writings that confirm the facts. You ready for this? Number one. Archaeology confirms the use of stone water jars in New Testament times. Now remember, this is about the resurrection. Number two. Early Christians were ascetic, so the wine miracle was not invented. Number three, archaeology confirms the proper place of Jacob's well, and he provides a Bible quote that gives the location as there. Number four, Josephus says there was hostility between Jews and Samaritans. And number five, the Bible accurately describes the topography of Western Galilee. There is significant elevation drop from Cana to Capernaum. There, so now you're convinced about the resurrection, right? 
guess why this seemingly random thing, not about the resurrection, is chucked right in the middle of his section about evidence for the resurrection? Well, it's because it was plagiarized from... Do I need to say it? I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Chapter 10. And of course, the reason it's not about the resurrection is because it's not about the resurrection. It's about whether the book of John was written by an eyewitness. It gives 59 points about why Turek and Geisler think it was written by an eyewitness, and Almondo just takes the first five, sticks them in his book. Didn't even pick and choose, just one, two, three, four, and five out of 59. I'm starting to feel like it would have been more worth my time to review I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist instead of Almondo's book. From page 124 to 126, there's another very odd list, this time about theories about the resurrection. And what makes it so odd is that each item focuses on which known facts are contradicted by the theory. And these facts are numbered, but at no point in the entire rest of the book were any of these known facts enumerated. So Almanda will say something like, contradicts known facts number four, the tomb was empty. But there's no reason to refer to this as number four of anything because there's no list where that's item number four. You got any guesses as to why? Of course you do, it's plagiarism. But hey, at least there's some small amount of modification this time. Unfortunately, Almondo's modifications do absolutely nothing helpful and just make the list way more awkward to interpret. Originally, all the known facts were given in one numbered list, and then each of the theories could just refer back to whichever of the known facts it fails supposedly to explain. But he jammed each one of the known facts into parentheses after each theory, making everything really cluttered and also leading to tons of repetition. But not as much as there could be because he doesn't understand what a dash is, and so when he sees something like 5 to 12, he thinks that's referring to facts 5 and 12 instead of facts 5 through 12, and so he only copies in 5 and 12. And also he doesn't even understand what the list is about, because he says that this is about which facts each theory contradicts, not which ones it fails to explain, which is a very different thing. Amando, how are you ever supposed to be an author when you can't even get plagiarism right? On page 129, we have Jesus in the background with his head cut off. I have nothing to say about anything else on this page, but look at this. Try to imagine how this happened. Even more so, try to imagine how after it happened, Almando said, yeah, that looks great, and sent it to the printers. It's kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? Yeah. That's all that's worth saying about chapter 10, because it's just a bunch of Bible quotes and rambling about Jesus. We jump to page 139 at the end of chapter 11, a chapter that consists of weak responses to basic atheist objections that I don't even care to argue about. The objections are science proves everything but a god, miracles are impossible, the problem of evil, nobody has ever had a supernatural experience, the Bible has been rewritten through translation, who created God, evolution, Bible contradictions, supernatural experiences from other religions, there's more than one truth, the Bible supports slavery, Christians have done wars, the problem of evil, again. And then finally, after the final objection about the Bible having been changed and corrupted, he closes out the book. There are so many more objections that can be answered, and I would love to spend a lot more time covering them, but I'll see to it in another series. Series? Don't you mean book? For this book, use it as a guide to conversations in preparation for formal debates with your atheist friends. Oh yes, please do. That'll go wonderfully. By the way, how many people really have formal debates with their friends? That's a pretty small group of Christians you're addressing. And most importantly, use this book here to strengthen your faith and build your confidence in defending your position. As for the atheist, I hope you can humble yourself and be willing to unlearn to relearn. Remaining unbiased and open, seek the truth, and you will find it. Can you believe the balls on this guy to say something like that to anyone? Ever? The hubris of it is staggering. Like other past atheists did until they found God. Thank you for taking the time to read. God bless you abundantly. In Jesus' name, take care. Well, Almondo, as book endings go, that sure is one. So yeah, that's the book over and done with. Time to- You can't trust anything written by mere men. When this argument arises, I like to ask them where they got this information from. <laughs> Hold up, what's happening right now? Well, what's happening is he wrote the ending to his book, he closed it out as nicely as he's capable of, and then he realized there was another objection he wanted to add, and so instead of putting it before the outro, he just kind of stuck it right at the end of the document, because who fucking cares? Who cares? Almondo, right? <laughs>
Right, man? Why bother doing anything that makes any sense at all? Yeah? It's just your first book. It's not like it matters or anything. It has your name on it. I guess who cares? Did you even read this pile of shit before you published it? Huh? Did you? Of course! Of course you did! And then you said, perfect! Off to the printers! What were you thinking, man? At any point during the writing of this thing, did you stop to think at all? How is it even possible for someone to put their name on something like this? Who would do this to themselves? Almondo! I mean this with absolute sincerity! This is the worst book I've ever seen! It's the worst book I've ever even heard of! It's not even a contest! I've read a few books before that were silly. You know, with like silly claims, silly arguments. But those authors usually at least had the courtesy to run a spell check. And I've read other books with plenty of spelling and grammar errors too, although I have to say I've never seen anything quite like this in that regard. But even if I'd read a book with arguments as bad as yours, and spelling and grammar as bad as yours, and basic formatting as bad as yours. You know what I'm pretty sure they still didn't have? Massive heaping piles of plagiarized material. As in easily 50% of the book, probably more. Not only have I never read a book anywhere even close to this bad, I didn't even know books this bad existed. I assumed that anyone who would bother to take the time to write a book would have the tiny shred of self-respect it takes to at least use their own words. And then once they've done that, to maybe put them through some kind of basic proofreading process. But no, no, apparently none of that matters to you. Your book, Almondo, taught me nothing about anything you wanted me to learn about. I think it goes without saying that despite all your guarantees and your misplaced confidence, I am not a Christian after having read it, of course. But I did learn a lot by reading it. I learned an awful lot about you, and none of it, none of it, was good. This thing you've assembled from other people's work is a disgrace, and you should be ashamed of yourself. But I don't imagine you will be, because I don't think you're capable of shame. If you were, this disgusting object would not exist. Fuck you, Almondo, I'm out of here.